Good morning. Uh, my name is Andy Thomas. I'm Chief Clinical Officer here at the OSU Wexner Medical Center. Really want to thank all of our uh, members of the press uh, for joining today for our latest Wexner Medical Center media briefing. I'm joined today by Dr. Aaron Friedberg, Assistant Professor of Clinical Internal Medicine in our Division of Internal, uh, General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics here at Ohio State, and also by Dr. Peter Moller, our Chief Scientific Officer for the Wexner Medical Center and the Interim Vice President for Research for the Ohio State University. We're really excited to take your questions. Uh, first, we're gonna have some comments uh, uh, about where we are with the COVID pandemic. And then Dr. Uh, Moeller will uh, give a brief update on where we are with variants and talk about how lay people can pick out good science from misinformation in social media or online. And Dr. Friedberg will be uh, talking a little bit about our post COVID recovery program and what we're seeing with long haul patients who have extended COVID sy symptoms once they recover from uh, the virus. I'm going to start out before we get to our uh, our other guests. Start out uh, start out by just showing some data of where we are uh, in uh, in the state related to uh, COVID uh, nineteen. What you're seeing on the screen uh, currently uh, is our case data. Each uh, vertical blue bar is our number of cases diagnosed per day, and the red the blue line is the seven day moving average of cases. This is data back to the beginning of the pandemic in spring of 2020. As you can see, we've reached now over 7,000 cases per day on a seven day moving average, really getting us back to where we were in mid January in terms of the number of cases. And since really August 1st, a uh, significant increase in terms of the number of new cases diagnosed in the state. Uh, here is just the last 30 days looking at that trend where 30 days ago we were really about a third of where we are now in terms of cases per day. Once again, that 7,000 cases per day is, is gets us pretty much back to, to January. I'm gonna talk a little bit about hospitalizations and our hospital uh, COVID census. Uh, just to reorient people, when we talk about zone two, we mean regions four, seven, and eight uh, in the state of Ohio. So those counties in central Ohio and region four, counties in region seven, which is to the south of central Ohio, and then region eight, which is to the southeast and east of the state. This uh, line to, to orient folks, the blue line is the count of patients in the hospital with active COVID on any given day uh, 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 since the be, uh, April of, of 2020. Uh, as you can see, uh, we've continued the trends we talked about last week uh, with the number of cases moving up. If you look back just at August 1st, we had 150 COVID patients in the hospital in our zone. Today, we have 969 patients. Our highest day back in December of 2020 was at 1,200 patients. So we're now six-fold higher than we were just on August 1st, just in over the last six weeks. And when we're now over 75% of where we were on our worst day back in December. Here in Franklin County, the trends are similar. We had 81 patients in the hospital with active COVID on August 1st. Today, we're at 395, just shy of 400. That, and those are just in the adult hospitals. Uh, that's essentially a five-fold increase over the past six weeks. But what I want to highlight a little bit this morning is what's going on in regions seven and eight. Today, region seven, that area to the south of, uh, of central Ohio, has the most COVID patients in the hospital on any day since the pandemic started in the spring of 2020. And region eight is not far behind. A really significant increase, those same trajectory of, of that blue line over the last six weeks is really impacting that southeastern part of the state uh, uh, similarly. In fact, this led um, earlier this week to the hospital CEOs from nine hospitals and health systems across the southern and southeastern part of the state to put out really what I've never quite seen uh, before from this area of the state, a joint letter signed by all nine CEOs. This is very similar to what the four Central Ohio hospital CEOs did a couple of weeks ago, and many of you have seen full page ads, there's radio PSAs, but these nine hospital CEOs are reaching out to their communities jointly in an effort to really talk about the impact this is having on their hospitals, on their ability to care for patients uh, that don't have COVID in their communities. Uh, the good news is these CEOs uh, were shared on a meeting we had yesterday that they're getting hundreds of thousands of shares and hits and views on their social media pages by members of their community that really want to share good information about what's going on in their community and the impact this is having in their towns or in their county uh, with their friends. 
So it's, it's uh, hopefully a, a way that we can get the right message out through our social media channels, really from trusted local sources, which is your local hospital, your local uh, provider. Uh, last, before we go to our guests, I just wanted to give a quick highlight on where we are with COVID vaccinations. We continue to see higher rates of COVID vaccination uh, over the last uh, uh, four to six weeks compared to where we were over the summer. And a really good piece of news, we now are really uh, approaching basically at 85% of those over age 65 having at least their first dose of vaccine. And we just crossed 64% of all adults over age 18 uh, having uh, gotten their first dose of uh, vaccine in Ohio. So really, uh, you know, getting vaccinated, a, a key part of, uh, of any one individual's effort to fight COVID-19, but certainly a part of our community and our state's effort to fight uh, COVID-19. So thank you to uh, those who have gotten vaccinated and thank you to those in the media who are continuing to share the accurate information about the importance of, of vaccination. So uh, to our guests, I'll turn to Dr. Moeller uh, first. Uh, uh, Peter, uh, any updates on where we are with the Delta variant, what we're seeing with trends in, in variants over the past uh, week or two? Great question, Andy. So at the Wexner Medical Center, we continue to actively sequence positive cases to really understand what the viral signature is. We've seen over the course of really the last few months sort of an evolution from an alpha strain to Delta strains that that you know that we see as the dominant variants these days. We're also hearing, and you've probably seen in the news, Andy, some updates on something called the mu variant. This is a variant that's coming out of Colombia, South America. While we are actively watching some for some of these viral variants here in the central Ohio area, we've not seen this. Um, Delta continues to be the dominant variant, and very likely it's much more of an evolutionary evolutionarily fit virus. And so we'll likely continue to see the Delta even out competing the mu variant. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, Peter, you've been a, a scientist now for most of your adult life. Uh, you, you're used to reading scientific papers and, and trying to figure out if something that's being made as a, as a claim in a scientific paper is, uh, uh, is valid, is verifiable. But put yourself a little bit in the shoes of Bob and Betty Buckeye that are seeing things come across their Facebook or Twitter feed. Uh, they're maybe reading something, hearing something at church or at work from a friend. How can the average layperson in Ohio uh, work to judge what's good science versus maybe misinformation? Yeah, great question. And we continue to see a lot of interest in science um, since the pandemic began. I would say three big areas that, that, that the public should look at. The first is how well the study was designed. So is the study controlled in a population that's large enough to be able to make an impact? The second thing, Andy, that we look at is whether something is peer reviewed. So if a, if a claim is made, have other scientists actually had a chance to look at the data or physicians to look at the data to say, you know, this makes sense or this is worth studying. And then the third thing we look at is, is something reproducible? Meaning that if I take that same virus or those same tools and try to test this in two or three other labs, are my colleagues seeing the same thing as another? So I, you know, I liken it to, I can go out as I'm a football fan, I can go out and buy a football, I can buy a whistle and I can buy a t-shirt that says coach. That doesn't make me a football coach. And so what the lay public should really do is to look to see, you know, are the experiments being performed by scientists that have a background in this area? If they click on a link, does it link them to three other links that aren't scientific papers, or does it link into a TV show or a blog or a Facebook page? So those are the sort of red flags that we look at and then continue to see that. A good example is what's happening in ivermectin. Ivermectin is something that's appeared on the news multiple times as a potential therapy for, or even a preventive therapy for, for COVID. We've actually seen some of the same rigor show that a lot of these studies that ivermectin has been claimed to to um, reduce COVID infection or even th therapeutic for COVID infection be now retracted. And so, you know, some of these things are science being wrong, but a lot of these things are potentially dangerous in the doses that some of the original studies have come out with. Well, I think your point's a good one about the link to the link to the link. I think when you're seeing someone's Facebook post or Twitter post, and that takes you to a blog, that takes you to an opinion piece, that takes you to another blog, and it never really gets down to where was that actual science done? And has that science only been done at one place by someone who's frankly not in the field? 
uh, or has that science been done and then done again and done again and shown? There's always a first time something's reported, but it should be relatively reproducible relatively quickly. I think that's great feedback for, for folks. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate you being here with us this morning. Uh, Dr. Friedberg, I uh, want we'll turn a little bit to our COVID recovery program. Uh, first, can you just kind of step back at the 5,000 foot level and talk about uh, where we are with uh, patients who are who've recovered from the acute phase of their virus and and what we mean by long haul as a type of symptom? Yeah, sure. So I, you know there are a lot of names here, and I, I know it could be confusing. And, and part of that is just you know there are so many ways it can it can be. Um, you know the official term from the National Institutes of Health or the NIH is uh, post acute sequelae of COVID nineteen, but lots of other terms, post-COVID conditions, long COVID, long-haul COVID, uh, post-acute COVID, long-term effects of COVID, uh, chronic COVID. Um, and, and you know, with all of that, I think really it comes down to this thing we've all kind of been seeing, which is, um, at least if you ask the, you know, the CDC, what do they see most commonly? Uh, you know, fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, cough, uh, joint pain and chest pain, but it can be all sorts of different things. Um, you know, problems with thinking and, and cognition, you know, difficulty concentrating or even speaking, uh, depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress, uh, muscle and joint pain, uh, headaches, uh, loss or change in your taste or smell, uh, hair loss, rapid heartbeat, uh, even, you know, fevers on and off. And the severity ranges too. It can range from, you know, sort of frustrating uh, and, and temporary to really devastating and long-lasting and, you know, it can really affect pretty much all aspects of uh, life and, and function. Thank you for that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about our approach here in terms of uh, how we've developed an evidence-based practice guideline in concert with our colleagues from Bonds Corps Mercy Health that really tried to help providers and to some degree even help patients figure out their way through uh, these sorts of symptoms? Yeah, and again, it's, it's a tough one because you can you know, come in with lots of symptoms at once or, or just one or, or several things. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, one of the you know, privileges of being in an academic medical center and working with our, our colleagues is that we get to you know, get this team of professionals together and you know, look, at the, look at the data, you know, look through what, what information is there and what do we know and try to put together a plan so that uh, you know, we and, and our colleagues know where to start and what things there's evidence for and what things you know, maybe got tried and didn't work, what things may be harmful. And I think especially making sure that we're not overdoing imaging tests and other really expensive tests that most likely aren't going to have any benefit to the patient in terms of an underlying cause of their, their symptoms. Yeah, definitely. You know, one, one of our, uh, our biases is we always want to know. And so it, it's, it's uh, sometimes very tempting to order the test or the image because you want to see something. And one of the, I think, really frustrating things with COVID and, and, and post-COVID is that, uh, you know, sometimes we do see things. Uh, you know, for example, we can see things like uh, you know, fibrosis or, you know, injury and inflammation in the, in the heart muscle for folks after they've had uh, an infection with COVID-19, um, or we'll see scarring in the lungs. But uh, what we've found is that there often is not a whole lot to see, at least with the tests that we have available. And so um, that doesn't make the symptoms any less real. It just means that we may not quite have the test yet to see exactly what's going on. Got it. Can you talk a little bit about our clinic here? I know it got off the ground a few months ago and you've really been refining how patients move through the system and uh, how we take referrals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for our clinic and, and you know, the, the motivation here is that, um, you know, for me, I, I'm, I work as an internal medicine physician in uh, primary care and also in the hospital. Um, and for me, I was just seeing a lot of my own patients who had these symptoms and they just didn't know what to do. They felt really lost. And um, I just wanted to find a way to help them. I, you know, I think folks can really feel very alone and, and scared and, and very misunderstood. Uh, you know, part of the challenge is you know, these, these post-COVID uh, complications that can leave folks often with really no outward sign of what's going on. And so um, I think this is true for a lot of chronic illness, but it can be really hard for other people to understand you know, why they're feeling that way or, and what they're experiencing with their illness. So um, you know, because it impacts so many different parts of the body, uh, you know, lungs, heart, uh, joints, brain, uh, you know, we knew we wanted to work as a team to try to, uh, you know, give the best care for these folks uh, who had post-COVID uh, complications. And, uh, you know, the idea with our clinic is we wanted to have a, a space where, um, you know, folks who are suffering you know, from this, it can get really close attention. 
um, and can benefit from our specialty knowledge. And basically, we wanted to leverage the power of our uh, academic medical center at uh, Ohio State University to try to work to improve the quality of you know folks with their their daily lives when they're suffering from this. Well, th thinking about uh, you know once again the average patient who hasn't had COVID and they're concerned about these kind of prolonged recovery type symptoms. What's what's the best way to prevent that? So I, I wish we had a great way to, you know, keep you from having this. I, I think it's, you know, it's a pretty scary thing that, you know, not only can you have this, you know, potentially very terrible illness with COVID-19, but then it can stick with you for, you know, who knows how long, months, years, we don't know yet. Um, and the best thing that you can do is not get COVID in the first place. And the best defense we have is, is vaccination, is to go get vaccinated. Um, there's no better way to do it. Um, and there was even a study that came out, I think it was in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, it was a big study on the British population. And uh, not only did we have a, a major reduction, you know, 70 plus percent in, you know, getting infected if you've been vaccinated with, you know, any of the several vaccines they had, um, but even if you caught COVID, uh, you know, when you've been vaccinated, your odds of having, you know, long lasting, you know, COVID symptoms uh, were cut down by almost 50%. So not only can you avoid it in the first place, then even if you get it, you're less likely to have long-term symptoms, which is uh, pretty impressive. That's just another good reason to go out and get vaccinated. That, thank you for sharing that. One other question, I guess, Aaron, that I would have for you is what, what are we doing in terms of research? You mentioned the uh, the importance of being an academic medical center of how we're approaching this. What uh, what are we doing in terms of research around uh, COVID uh, long uh, uh, kind of prolonged symptoms? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting topic because you know, even though we don't have a, a test that tells you you have post COVID or a, you know even a, a single clear definition yet, I, I think we all know from our experience, you know, taking care of of, of these folks that there's really kind of a common set of symptoms that goes along with this with you know some differences between each person. Um, but there's so much we don't know. Uh, you know, what what makes you more likely to have post COVID complications? You know, some people feel terrible and some people feel fine. You know, why is that? Um, and why do some people get better really fast? You know, we'll see folks that lose their smell, uh, but it's back within a couple of weeks. Now the folks still can't smell, you know, six, 12 months later, what's different and what made that happen? Um, and then what tests are useful? Like I was saying, you know, what, what can we do to figure this out? You know, what treatments are the most effective? So um, that's the nice thing about being in an, an academic medical center is we have this team of professionals where, uh, you know, we don't just provide care and, and apply what we, what we know and what we're learning, um, but also we, have, you know, we specialize in, in research and, you know, try to answer those big questions to figure out the best way to care for our patients. And our, you know, one of our goals is to you know, assemble information from, from our experiences, taking care of folks and, and being there with them. Um, and to not only create studies that, uh, you know, help figure these things out here, but, you know, also participate in, you know, what other folks are doing to answer those questions. Great, thank you. Um, I'm getting a question uh, through the chat about any risk of unvaccinated people being refused care um, at a hospital. Um, I'll do my best to try and answer that. There certainly are no plans to at all uh, turn people away based on their vaccination status in terms of unvaccinated people being refused a ventilator or uh, being refused care in hospitals. Obviously, uh, uh, as I've shared in multiple venues, many of you have seen me speak, um, we really want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to be vaccinated. It is the, the, the thing that's going to get our community, to get our state through uh, this, but uh, um, at this point, I, I, from an ethics perspective, uh, uh, from a variety of perspectives, uh, uh, just a pure human perspective, I don't think we would ever get to the point where we're turning people away uh, solely because they've chosen not to get vaccinated. Uh, the, o the only point I think I would also add to that is we are seeing, and this is a probably a little bit more than anecdotal, but I'm not sure it's statistically significant, some individuals who are unvaccinated who who then get diagnosed with COVID who meet criteria for the monoclonal infusion treatment who are also turning down the monoclonal infusion treatments uh, when they're offered. Their doctor says you're high risk for being in the hospital, high risk for getting sick. You should get one of these treatments. And when our pharmacists and our physicians call them to try and consent them to have them come in to get the infusion, uh, they turn that down too. So I, I do worry that there is a group of individuals that aren't getting vaccinated that aren't masking, that probably aren't really watching what they're doing in terms of 
of, uh, of uh, you know, social distancing and, and so forth. And then when they do get sick, they're also turning down a therapy that can reduce your risk of being admitted uh, by uh, 70% if you're a high risk uh, individual. So um, just uh, the more education we can get uh, through the media for people uh, in terms of the benefits of these treatments and benefits of vaccination, the uh, better off we're, we're gonna be. I did put a link to the Healthy State Alliance guideline uh, that was referenced earlier in Dr. Friedberg's uh, uh, comments. Uh, that is, uh, was done jointly with uh, colleagues from Von Spore Mercy Health, and we're working together with them also on provider education. We had a large uh, symposium earlier this spring, and we'll be doing another one uh, uh, later this year uh, around uh, COVID-19, really the, for basic updates for uh, providers, nurse practitioners, uh, social workers, everyone in kind of in the healthcare space um, on, uh, on these issues. Once again, I want to thank Dr. Friedberg for being here. Uh, this morning uh, with us. And Dr. Moeller, as always, it's terrific uh, seeing you. And uh, to all of our uh, colleagues from the media, please thank you for all you're doing and uh, let us know if we can help in any way with any questions. Take care. Thank you all very much.